salt the dead close the veil changer of shapes alone on hooves autumn comes and brings the pagan dead who seek the warmth of the sam hain fire the sawane fire welcome the streaming evil live show my name is jeff and tonight we have a very special episode very special treat for you uh been wanting to do a sam hain themed episode i know we talk about sam hain a lot on this show i mean <laughs> not a, not a, not a not such a wide variety of topics you know um but we i've been wanting to do a november themed sam hain show for a while i couldn't think of a better guest than steve zing himself so we're going to bring him in but first let's do our little theme song because it wouldn't be the show without the theme so i'm going to just play that real quick jeff is gonna talk about the misfits right now He's a nerd about this stuff, obsessed anyhow. Jeff never shuts his face, always needs to talk. My eyes show some weight if he went out for a walk. Do you think that he cares? He doesn't care. He's not in courage. Backstage. Okay, now we can begin the show. Okay, hello. Uh, before I welcome my guest, just to let you know, I see a lot of comments. We will definitely get to some comments at some point, but I have an itinerary here. Um, I want to ask Steve some stuff. We're going to talk. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll make sure we get to everything. So if you see me zipping by in the comments, it's because I'm trying to focus on um, conversation. Uh, without further ado... Let me bring in the one, the only, Mr. Steve Zing. Hello. Something's wrong with your connection. You're like coming like this. You're really... Really? Even right now? Damn. Why has it always got to be that way? Can you hear me okay, though? Do I sound fine to you? Your, your sound... Uh, no, stop yes. it. Stop it. It can't be. I'm no. going to get out and come back in. How all right. That? All right. Do that. Do that. Okay, Steve, Steve is going to come. I'm kicking him out, and he's going to come back in. He says, I'm coming in all weird. How do I sound, guys? How do I look right now? I'm just curious to know. It's too early in the show to start having shenanigans and trickery because it's just too early for that. Anybody let me know what in the heck is going on. Okay, he's back. Blah, blah, blah is back. You're really, really... Why is that like this right now? Is that normal? Is that supposed to be like that? No, I don't know. You can hear me, though, okay, right? I don't... I'm not kidding. Oh, it's shit. Fun. It's... I don't know what it is. Everybody's, everybody in the chat is saying that it sounds perfect on their end. This is is that terrible. like a filter or something like that? No, no. I mean, I no. I, I, I here. Hold on. I can't understand you because I uh, I think did Jeff leave us? No, I'm here. Hello. How do I look? No. What is up with this? Not on this show. Not tonight. Not tonight. Everybody says it sounds good. I have good. no idea what's going on. This is so crazy. Hold on. I'm gonna call you, Steve. Why is, why, why is this a problem? This shouldn't be an issue. They, all right. Everybody's saying that it's, everybody's asking if you're on a phone or a tablet because I sound normal and that it must, it's, it has to be an issue on your end. Okay. Steve just, okay. There he is. Hello. Nothing. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. You sound fine. Okay, let me ask you, Steve. You, is it you? You're, you're like slow. Even my even my voice is slow. Yeah. Come on, no! Why does this have to happen right now? Um, could it be it? Uh, Rue is saying that it might be that you're on a phone or a tablet. Is that why? Could that be the reason? I don't know. Let me see what it looks like. 
on my thing. Okay, he just bounced out. Let's see. Hopefully, Steve can come back in here and make this. Everybody's saying the 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 video and the sound for both of you is perfect. So I don't I don't understand. It's a connection. It must be an interconnection with the software. Okay, he's back again. He's still shaking his head though. He's still shaking your head. What is going on? Is there any um is there any way you could try it on your computer? See if that makes a difference. I don't I don't know if this is affecting anybody else. I, I can't No, everybody in the comments is saying that both of us sound perfectly fine. They hear us fine. It's between me and you that's the problem. So maybe you should log out and log back in. If I do, then the whole thing will be I, I'm gonna try that, but if I if 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 I close it, then the whole thing gets closed. Hold on. I don't know what this guy just said. I have no idea. <laughs> oh my God. Why does this have to happen now? <laughs> Should we just try and restart it? I don't know. I don't know what to do. You know, when you first came on, you were fine. And then, yeah. and then it just came down. That's so bizarre. Because I is anybody chatting about this? Can or is, are you doing? Is that happening yes? There? Everybody in the chat says we both sound just fine. I don't even know what you're. I can't. All you right, hold, sound on, like, hold uh, on, hold on. I'm calling you. I'm calling you. Hold on. I'm calling you right now. You're gonna call me? Yes. All right. Just one second. Hi. Um, so I everybody in the chat is saying that we everybody they can hear us just fine. It's between it's you can't it's something has to do with your and mine connectivity because everybody in the chat hears both of us and sees both of us perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Is that you? You don't have any sort of connectivity on your computer, like a like a like a web oh, man. All right, yeah, try it, try it, and see what happens. I'll I'll uh, I'll just keep talking here. Bye. Okay, let's just keep let let's keep. We're gonna keep the show running. Steve is gonna clear his cache, and we're gonna try this again. Hopefully, we can get something to work. He was just here. He was just here last week, and we had no problem. So I don't know. In any case, there's a lot to talk about. In, in the terms of Sam Hain and, you know, Steve and Steve's relationship with Sam Hain and music and Lodi all at that time. Um, <laughs> only on a From Us show could this happen. You know, if this is any other corner of the internet, it would be perfectly fine, you know, perfectly fine. Um, but, you know, Steve's story begins in the town of Lodi. He's from Lodi, the same as all those other guys. A lot of bands came out of Lodi. You have the Lodi bands. You got you got the Misfits, obviously. And then after the Misfits comes Sam Hain. You have Morning Noise. Well, that's Steve's band. And before that, they were called Implosion. Okay, Steve's back. And then before that, and then the other band is you had Rosemary's Babies. And then you had a band called Active Ingredients, too. All these bands, it's all just like uh, interconnected in one way or another. Hello. Now I can hear you. Yes. Oh my God. You that was sound like... like the Cookie Monster. I do love cookies. So cookies. that that makes sense. That makes sense. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, Truly, Jeffrey, it's a pleasure. Um, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, we, so I let let's just jump. Let's jump into it. We I. You know, you, you do so many interviews, Steve. We, we, we've we heard you, you know, speak a, a, at great lengths about a variety of things. So I'm going to jump around. And the first thing I want to ask you about, you've told this story before, but I, I you know, I, I don't know who was there when you told it. And I just think it's a really great story. I didn't know this about you. You tell me about the ice cream truck, the ice cream truck guy, the, the, the thing with the ice cream truck. What oh, was that uh all about? So when I was younger in my teens, we had a, 
there was the Mr. Soft, the ice cream truck that would come around during the summertime in our neighborhood and um, kind of became friends with this guy. His name was Bob. I called him Bob Softy. So, um, so after a while, like I would help Bob out. I'd get on the truck and kind of ride around part of the town in Lodi and, you know, throw his garbage out and he'd give me, you know, a few bucks and free ice cream. So it was great. So then like, I don't know, um, one season, one day Bob stops coming and like, that's weird. Summertime, right? So I don't know, a few weeks later, there's a new Mr. Softy truck. And I, and I said to the guy, I'm like, what happened to Bob? They're like, Oh, Bob was killed. So this was the eighties. There was no internet or whatever. So fast forward, um, I was on my way to LA, which I do every three to four weeks. And, um, I was delayed as usual. And so I went into the, you know, one of those magazine shops and there was a book called um, The Iceman Confessions of a Serial Killer. Now, anybody who lives, who's from New Jersey knows about The Iceman. Now, this is not the Mr. Softy guy. The Iceman was this guy by the name of Richard Kuklinski. He was a serial killer and he... Um, uh, murdered a bunch of people. You know, he lived in Jersey. Actually, my brother was in a prison with him one time, but nevertheless, long, oh, that's another story. But anyway, um, so I opened the book and I'm just looking through the book and there's a chapter called Mr. Softy. Oh my God. And it mem mentions Bob Softy. So what's interesting is there's a picture in the book. Now, the Mr. Softy truck only had one seat, and that was for the driver, right? There was no other seat. There was no passenger seat. So what Bob Softy did for me was he got a bar stool, and he put it, like, where there would be a passenger seat. Right. Well, Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman, killed him right in his truck, and he slumped over the bar stool that he put in there for me. Oh, my God. And the reason why Richard Kuklinski killed the Mr. Softy guys, because the, the, the Iceman would never hurt women or children. The Mr. Softy guy asked him to kill his wife and son so he could collect the um, insurance money. Oh, so, my God. So Kuklinski, he goes, I'm fucked up, but you're even more fucked up because you want me to kill your only son and your wife. So he goes, I, I got to get rid of you. So that's he popped him right in his truck. That's like it, so, so but but go back to the Mr. Softy guy was a serial killer as well. Right, so for right, like right. Three seasons I was riding around with the serial killer. And he what, what he was what he, what the Mr. Softy guy specialized in was explosives and and oh um my god. Uh uh what do they call it? Um uh, poison, arsenic. So arsenic. So what we, what he would do is, um, he would you know you would go up with your kids to buy some ice cream, and he would go nothing for you, Dad. Is no, he goes, yeah, let me give you a Sunday on the house. Get so he'd the make it, and he'd put just a dash of, you know, whatever poison it was, oh. and by the time the person ate it in a little while, like he would drive off, and it looked like the guy would have a heart attack. So in the amount of time, by the time they got him to the hospital, figured out what was wrong, you, it, it doesn't leave a trace in the body. So it just looks like he had a heart attack. So he would do that to test different things. But he was a serial killer himself, which is how he met Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman. He taught the Iceman how to kill with poison and, oh my God. and remote uh, control detonators. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Let me ask you two questions about this. First of all, what the fuck is going through your mind when you're in the bookstore, you're reading this thing, you're yeah. learning this news, and who do you call? Who's the first person? Because it's like, that's like the type of thing where it's like, uh, you have to tell someone, right? I'm, I'm trying to think like, hold on, I'm trying to... You want me to... I can switch it like this if you like that better, and you can do it vertical. Uh, you, you tell me what's yeah, better. That, yeah, I guess that's better. Okay. Uh, 
I don't know. I, I called a bunch of friends. I'm like, you're not going to believe this. I think I might have called my friend um, Joe Olivetti, right? Because Joe, so, <laughs> Joe used to get mad at me when I would ride the Mr. Softy truck because Joe would be taking a, uh, a nap and I'd be on the PA in the truck like, here comes Mr. Softy. I was like, will you shut the fuck up? You know, so. Wow. Because that would be the first thing that comes to my mind. I, I for I, I don't. I want to keep this about you and Sam Hain. I, I remind me to tell you a very similar, not a, 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 a slightly similar story that happened to me. Very similar sort of thing. I knew a killer. It, it's crazy. It's really because you think because because the thing is, you think back to your interactions with that person, and you're going, this person would never hurt a fly, or this person I can't well, imagine them doing this well, kind of thing. Who would ever think that the Mr. Softy guy was a serial killer? Oh, like, like it's the perfect, like, cover. Right. I mean, nobody suspects the ice cream man. Of course not. <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, oh, that's, that is really, that's really trippy. And then all those years, you're just kind of always like, yeah, I don't know. He just sort of fell off. He just sort of went somewhere. I don't know. Who well, knows? I, I, know, I, I knew he was murdered, but, uh, you know, right. again. You know, this is pre-internet and stuff, so you really didn't have that kind of information back then. So here's my other question to you, and I know this sound this is kind of grim and dark, but like the the thought must have crossed your mind, like why, like the, like how he just he liked you, he liked you, and you were his buddy, and uh, you know, um, you know, maybe it was more like I I, I was part of the decoy of what oh, he was really doing. God, you know? that I is. Don't know. That is an insane. I mean, you could write your own friggin' book. That's insane, truly insane. Um, but moving on from ice cream, I, you know, this is another question I don't know about you. And we've known each other for about ten years now. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think I know a, a, a fair amount about you know your exploits and the history of your bands and yada yada yada. What is the name Zing? I've never. I don't know. What is what is Steve Zing? Where, where does the name Zing come from? Actually, uh, Chris Morant is partially to blame for that and he may not remember this but this is how it kind of went down so um when we were in uh, maybe i was a freshman or sophomore uh chris Morantz is a few years older and uh you know chris used to take me and uh my cousin john from morning noise you know he'd pick us up and we would start making our own shirts right all different kinds of shirts, screen, you know, with right. this thing called photo emulsion. So you would mix this stuff and you'd put it on the screen. So the stuff that we clean the screens with, there, there used to be a, a, um, a uh, before Home Depot, there was a chain of um, home centers called Pergament. And Pergament, I know Pergament. Sold, Pergament. Sold, sold this stuff called Zing, right? <laughs> it, it was like... Um, it was almost like a turpentine remover, like okay, you know, yeah, um, yeah, spirit stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it had this sweet smell, and I would take this can and I go, <laughs> right, of the zing, and Chris goes, "We're gonna car start calling you Steve Zing," and that's how it was. But here's here's something crazy: when I purchased my first home. I guess that was 1992 or 93. So the day we go through to do the walkthrough with the realtor, the day we do the closing of the house, I go into the basement and the only thing that's left in the house is a can of zing. You were like, zing. I'm like, yeah. You're like, zing. <laughs> You're like, it's like, hey, Steve, where did you go? Oh, I, I'll be I, up in I, a minute. I, <laughs> I wish it was a better story to the name, but that's really the name. So, no, that's pretty good. I mean, again, I just had no. I mean, everybody knows you're synonymous with this zing. People make puns and jokes about it, but it's like nobody know. I, I didn't know the origin, so that was good. That's good to know. But you talked about you talked about Chris being Chris was uh, Chris was class of eighty. You were class of eighty two. You guys went to Lodi High. And you guys were into punk rock and you're making t-shirts. Now, did the t-shirt making 
does that begin with you know your acquaintance acquaintanceship i know that's not a real word i just made it up acquaintanceship so, so, with glenn or how does that start no so um well you know i became friends with chris and his friend bob uh who aka post-mortem from right. rosemary's babies right and um i was like the little kid and they were they would take me to new york to buy records and shows and like the dead kennedys and stuff and uh and chris actually so chris is actually a really good drummer but hmm. being that i was on drums um chris is like well i, I have a bass uh, my brother has a bass i'll fuck around with that if you're on drums ashley I, did, I couldn't i was i could right um i couldn't i didn't play drums too well so chris actually taught me really coordination on drums wow once he taught me coordination that was it then i just put on misfits and ramones records and i self-taught myself but chris is the person who taught me coordination coordination on drums what does that mean explain to as someone well, who's not a musician what is coordination in playing well, drums when you as a drummer right you have yeah. two hands and two feet yeah well each 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 thing has to do something different. Right. Think right. about it. So you try to do something and make your feet make your feet do something different than your hands. Make Impossible. Your left foot do, well, <laughs> Impossible. That's that's coordination. Right. All right. So, but and and you know, and I was it was pretty early on for me playing, and um, I remember Chris had tried showing me the song. I just couldn't get it. And it's the simplest beat in the world, but I, I didn't get it. So he kind of broke it down for me. And once I, you know, got it, it was like, oh, that's it. Okay. I think we could do this now. And right. that, that was it. So Chris really was my, was my main teacher. And what's interesting is, and then you said you start, you jump into Ramones and Misfits, which are also, you know, I mean, I don't know what what miss. I would assume Static Age Misfits and yes, uh, okay. You know, it, was the, it was the Jim Catania, the Mr. Jim era, right? And, right. You know that was a big influence of mine. Um, you know, growing up playing to those songs, and of course Tommy Ramone because of the speed, right? You know, right. The, the speed of that those songs was like, like. Oh no, Steve! We lost your volume. Oh shit. No, this interview was just getting good. There. Hello. There you are. Am I still there? Yep, you're here. Can you hear okay, me? Okay, sorry. No, it's cool. You there? Um but anyway, um can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. You're good. Okay. I, do I do you, am I coming in okay? Oh, we lost you again. Uh no. You lost me? You don't see me? I could no, I can't see you, but I can What is all right, uh, that is so weird. Let's keep keep it going. Keep keep uh, uh if you can hear so, me, then you can hear me. Yeah. So oh, no, anyway, you. Um, uh, you know, so we, st we, so again, we would make these t-shirts and um, I don't know, um, and just for ourselves. Uh, Where do you learn? So I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish what you were saying. All kinds of things we'd make. Where do you learn that process? Um, you know what? They used to sell these kits. Mm. You know, it was a kit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and you project it against um, the wall. You trace the image. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yep. That's crazy. Uh, well, not necessarily. No, actually, you didn't. So, what you did was, um, you'd go to a printer, right, or mm -hmm. a library, and you would buy these acetates, right? It was a clear, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was just clear. It was like transparencies. A, a transparency yeah and you'd put that through the printer rather than a white piece of paper and on it would print right you know whatever you're doing and then you would set that you would put this photo emotion stuff down and it would dry and you'd have you you had to go in the dark and then you'd put this transparency over the emulsion and put a light like you know i don't know a foot over the over the uh, screen and that would burn the, the image that transparency into the photo emulsion and then what you would do there is then spray spray it off and like anything that was black would come 
would spray off. It was an interesting thing the way they did it. But what's interesting about that is that like this, this like how to do it yourself kit is what then, and then all of a sudden it's like, Hey, I want to make my own stuff or I want to, you know, I'm into this thing called punk rock and making our own stuff. And then that goes hand in hand with, with making t-shirts, you know? Right. Right. Well, we T couldn't afford anything else. So, we were, right. You know, tell me about, tell me about, okay. So we were talking again, you, you were talking about being two years behind, um, uh, Chris and you, you were, you went to Lodi high school and you're into punk rock and what is it like? Okay. So like, this is the age where, you know, today it's the tropes have changed, especially, I don't even know what they are now with like whatever the, the millenn the generation Z's and whatnot. But back in the day, the, the notion of being a punk and a nerd and a jock was very real and very much like, if you're a punk, you're going to get beaten up by a jock or you're going to have adversarial situations with these other groups of people. Uh I, I wasn't um, well received in in high school. Um, and as a matter of fact, Chris actually protected me from some this biker guy. I forgot the name. He went to school because um, uh, again, it wasn't accepted like it is now. Right. You know what I mean? It just it's just so um, you know everybody would make fun of you and stuff and i remember getting um there was a cheerleader that um i had some intimate relationship but i wasn't her boyfriend or anything she was actually seeing one of the jocks in high school and uh -oh. he would make fun of me like ha ha, ha punk rocker ha, ha. <laughs> and i was i would laugh at him because i'm like i'm banging your girlfriend yeah on the Whatever. on the on the flip side um no that's that's uh that's interesting so so this no and then you have somebody like doyle who's got like pink hair or he's got blue hair and he's also on the football team and he's like the well, uh but but, <laughs> but, th but that was the difference right because doyle again was on the football team so right uh, he could hold his own really mattered because huh he could hold his own too yeah 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 that's interesting so you know it, it, it guard it didn't it didn't there were kids that made fun of him behind his back but they weren't going to do it in front of him what was so he's in the misfits while he's in high school people are aware of the misfits in lodi high yeah, school were, 80 80 82 they were they weren't popular then i remember the day doyle came in and gave out boxes of Night of the Living Dead 45s. Wow. And I in, remember, se in 79. In 79. Uh, he, no, no, we were... It was uh, later. And maybe it was 70, 80. Okay. They, they were just giving them out because they had too many. They didn't like the way they came out. So sound, right. You know. Um, and I remember when Doyle came to high school and gave me a copy of Walk Among Us. Wow. So. Wow. Unreal. Now, in as early as 1980, and again, Steve, you correct me on any of this stuff because I can't. I don't know if the, my information is good or, or not. In as early as 1980, you're getting together with friends, and you're jamming out misfit songs like "Teenagers from Mars" and stuff. Oh, we were doing that before 1980. It was me uh, and John. Yeah, and uh, the. Um... Uh, Mike from Morning Noise would come down. In fact, the first time I actually, Mike first came down, he was playing, he brought his saxophone down. I don't know. <laughs> but that's what he did. Um, uh, and we played the Teenagers from Mars. Um, it was, it was interesting. Look, you know, they were across the street. So it was like, right. you know, you couldn't avoid it. Um, and it was great. I mean, it was all new. It was all fresh at the time. So we didn't want to do it. You know, I mean, I remember Doyle giving me, in 1978, he gave me on an eight-track, mm. you know, 
uh, the tape. cartridge, he gave me a copy of Static Age. Static Age tape. You were in the inner circle. You were close enough to the band where that stuff was reverberating out, and you got to hear songs that people would well, hear for I, I years. I got to hear them rehearse it. So you, right. You see, so right near where, um, right next door to where Jerry and Doyle's uh, lived, there were these right. apartments that I lived in, and there was a garage, mm -hmm. and. I would sit on the garage at night by myself if John wasn't around or anybody else. And I'd sit there and just listen to the Misfits rehearse. And this is 1979. So I remember cool. I remember that idiot Bobby Steele coming in and and he was talking about Jimi Hendrix. He's like, ah, Jimi Hendrix did more drugs than any other punk rocker in the world and he's the best. I'm like, fuck that guy. You know, who gives a fuck about Jimi Hendrix? So what's interesting is you have this phenomena because 77 is the year of punk, right? Like the Sex Pistols are all over the international news. And then right in your own backyard, you have this local version that you can actually like interact, in, interact with and connect with. You don't have to go to New York City to go see the Ramones. Like it's literally right in your backyard. You literally can pop your head out the window and listen to they were they were stuff. loud they were yeah. loud. yeah i bet i bet yeah. um so yeah. yeah sorry go ahead continue no, uh, um you know i was fortunate that i had be uh, became friends with this old beatnik guy george germain who uh helped the misfits quite a bit was very close with the kayafas and very close with glenn so that's how I kind of got to know Glenn. Um, right. Right. And uh, let's see. I got to know Glenn in around 81. And then uh, I guess it was 82. My mom got me a car. And I Glenn didn't have a car, so I would take Glenn around to, if he had to get, um, um, like, uh, things printed for the Misfits. Right sleeves and things like that because they would do this thing where he would um, go to this printer here in Jersey and get all these uh, get the sleeves made and they would get them cut but you had to fold them and then put them in the plastic with, right. along with the record it was a very DIY DIY thing <laughs> you know so um, and but he had a hearse there was a hearse no that was that was way after oh that way was later after. okay Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. And that then was in the late 80s. And then at the same time, um, Morning Noise is also this other band that's in Lodi that's playing. And you you went into the studio with them to record a song for their 7 inch, right? Am I correct Ooh. on that? Morning Noise? No, no, not Morning Noise. Did I say Morning Noise? I meant Rosemary's Babies. Uh, Summer of 83? No. Uh, uh, Rosemary's Babies didn't happen until after morning noise right that started um uh, i you know i don't remember i remember recording some demos for them um on drums my, no on uh i had um i've always been into recording and obviously you can see i'm here in my studio right? trick or treat yeah so i got all kinds of show them the guitar real quick goodies here oh so this is the guitar that was used on Hard business, American nightmare. That's George Germain. He just used the name George Germain, the old beatnik guy. That's yep. the guitar. 57 hollow body, Gretsch? Yep. It's a yeah. 57 Gretsch guitar. With custom pickups. The pickups pick were changed out yeah. when Glenn recorded um, American Nightmare because he didn't like the uh, original Gretsch pickups. So George put these pickups in there for Glenn. Right. And um, yeah, so Glenn used it on a bunch of stuff. I believe they used it on the Who Killed Marilyn uh, 45 and stuff. So but, let me ask you this. Towards the end of Morning Noise, you had to tell me about meeting because um, he comes into, uh, you know, the history of, of Sam Hain as a guitar player. How did you meet Pete? I met Pete in college. So I, I was in college and I. Um, uh, there was this guy, and he would start talking to me, and he was telling me 
that he like Johnny Thunders and he was playing in this band called the Horror Lords. Right. And stuff. And um, so I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I don't know. We started hanging out and he was a lifeguard at a YMCA. And Glenn mm. and I would go to the YMCA in the wintertime to go swimming. <laughs> yep. And wow. Um, so we would do that. And um, and then I had him. He wound up joining morning noise for a little bit at the very end of morning noise at that time right before um which we ended once chris left and pete came in it was john and myself and mike and uh, we did a few things after that it was just you know there was no time anymore so but uh pete came in on guitar and i think he eventually played bass at our very last show which i think we opened up for I want to say Kraut and um, uh, um, an English punk band, and I can't remember the name. But anyway, it was at the Rock Hotel in New York. Um, and uh, so we needed a guitar player. You know, we start Sam Hain. It's myself and Glenn in the studio. We did Sam Hain. And now we needed to take it on the road. So we couldn't find, believe it or not, we could not find a guitar player. And some of the people that had, um, you know, auditioned just didn't cut it. So I said, well, what about Pete? He's like, oh, I don't know. He's got to dye his hair. I'm like, I think he'll dye his hair. And so I asked him, he said, yeah. And we went on the road and that was that. And I, nick- I named him Damien. <laughs> Damien. Damien, it's perfect. Uh, let me ask you this. Okay, so two things. There seem to be, there seem to be like several different things happening all at the same time, and I can never sort of figure this out because you're like, for instance, in the summer of of eighty three, you're there when Spot they go into Fox Studios in New Jersey, the Misfits do, yeah, and Spot, who's Black Flag's engineer and you know guy from oh, I from know Black. Spot. Yeah, right, right. But I'm just saying, like, for those who are not, this, this guy from the Black Flag Camp spot, he was like the first bassist or whatever, or something like that, um, who, who had tracked and recorded the Misfits, you know, that whole legendary, like, six hour, we did all the songs for Earth AD in six hours, but they hadn't done all the songs. They'd probably done it about seven songs with scratch vocals. They come back, they're doing the vocals, right, Steve? And then they add two songs that they track right there which are Blood Feast and um, what's it called? Uh, Death Comes Ripping, which were meant right. for Sam Yeah, Hain. that was, that was um, done at Fox Studios. Uh, I went to one of the sessions there uh, the, when they recorded it. It was crazy. They brought all their amps. It was like fucking ridiculous. Spot there were amps to do with down those. the hallways. It was, <laughs> it was nuts. But, Did, um, sorry, go ahead. Uh yeah, that was an interesting time. You know, they were trying to still be what they were. And, and of course, you know, hardcore was big. So they were trying to catch that wave a bit, playing a, a bit faster and whatnot. You know, I look, I love all, you know, the early Misfit stuff. Earth AD is probably my least favorite. You know, I, I, I like it in, in, not really in order. Obviously, Static Age is my favorite. Uh, then Walk Among Us. Then Horror Business. You know, um, I thought the Static Age lineup was the best. That to me, that captured the essence of 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 who Glenn is vocally, right, and mo- melodically. That's just my my thing. You know, right. Is um so you're there first of all is Henry Rollins do you remember seeing Henry Rollins at the session? No. Okay. Um, he claims to have done gang vocals at one of the Earth AD recording sessions. I wasn't sure if maybe that I was. I think one some of, them. of that was done on the West Coast. Right, right, right. But right, it wasn't right, right. in Jersey. Um, and so you're just there because you know you're friends with Doyle and you're you're hanging with Glenn and you just came along just to sort of see what was going down. Yeah cool 
that's really cool. But that that wasn't your first time in a recording studio because you had done stuff with Morning Noise, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, so then you, so then, so how does this all come together? Because how does Eerie come into the picture? It seems like there's there's a bunch of different stuff happening. You're doing these. You're doing stuff with Glenn. You record Initium in your bedroom on your four track, correct? So that's happening on one angle. Then you have the DC stuff, which you came down for. You flew at one point or drove or whatever down with Glenn when there was, might have been, Sam Hain might have been some sort of a, a real big super group, not just what? having Lyle. Well, because, you know, Minor Threat had been, uh, just had, broken up and stuff so it was like they yeah. all thought they would form but it was it, it you know those guys were just you know glenn wanted to go off in a different direction right which is how he got sam hayne uh, and those guys were kind of wanted to stick to what they were, did best and that was like the hardcore stuff so right you know um you know i'm glad it turned out the way it turned out Tell me about recording the track Initium in your bedroom. You have, you guys were jamming out. You were on drums. Glenn was on guitar, right? At some point. Nope. Well, for the, for the no. writing of the songs. No, no, no. I mean, sorry, I'm getting, I'm, I'm, con I'm conflating a bunch of different things here. On one hand, you're jamming. Just you and Glenn are jamming, right? You're on drums. He's on guitar. No vocals, and you guys are just jamming at one point or another just like sort of figuring okay. stuff out I, I i don't know am i am i right wrong i, I don't know yeah we, we did that quite often you you would do that and then how does that morph into doing initium the not the whole album just the track initium in your the bedroom beginning, the, the noise and stuff yeah 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 would you like to hear it i mean sure <laughs> of course <laughs> Steve is uh, currently queuing up something for us. I don't know what he's queuing up. I guess the the beginning of Initium, where Steve was Steve was playing a, a a Coke bottle on a bass string or something. I don't know. Oh, who the hell told you that? Uh, see, it's so great to have Steve sort of clarify things because you know the 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 mythology around this stuff. It just it just goes on and on and on and yada yada yada. Um, yeah, you guys had some weird atmosphere stuff, like some weird sort of stuff happening in that four track making stuff. Is that the first thing that was recorded for Initium, the album? No. What happened was uh, Chris's brother had loaned me a, a um, it was called an Echoplex. It was a delay, uh, pre-digital delay they had. Um, you had this box and it had a cartridge like a cassette and basically you would talk into it and there was a record head and a playback head. So the faster you did it, the more delay you got. So I had a bass at my house and I put it through this Echoplex and I turned up my speakers and I started getting feedback through the pickup of the bass wow. through the Echoplex and I would turn it on up and down to get that whoop, 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 right know? right right uh, i'm trying to find so cool i digitized it so i wouldn't lose it now i just have to find it now you digitized it because when you guys did the reunion shows you did initium for riot fest you needed that that sound uh yes but i also did it so because it was on a cassette at four track. Yeah, I cassette, want to pre so. preserve it. That makes sense. That makes total sense. And isn't that interesting, folks? How you just like you know you 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 take what you have at the time. Like that machinery is probably not intended for use like that. But then it's like, hey, how can we make this sound unique and different and do something cool? Let's do this. And then all of a sudden, you wind up with a crazy, unique, interesting sound on four track it's cool worked it worked i don't know where it is i, I got a whole i got so much stuff on here 
Um, I mean, we know. I definitely know what it sounds like. It is it is a really cool effect, and I, I have no I, idea I, how I it was can, made. I can separate the vocals and everything. Oh, you have right because you have you can we can actually listen this is to the it. Master. Anyway, oh, if I find. All it, right, you know. you let me know if you find. It. I'm gonna keep. Let's let's keep moving on here. So so you have this the 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 DC stuff doesn't work out, but Lyle sticks around for a little bit longer, and it seems like things are gonna work out with Lyle. Not really. We knew Lyle wasn't gonna work out. We needed him for the first show because we couldn't find a guitar player. Gotcha. So we used him, and he came. And of course, he came with a flannel shirt on because that's right. what guys in Minor Threat wore. It was right. Like, we knew that that wasn't going to work. And then at the same time, let me let me just jump around because it's like this is there's so much stuff that's happening concurrently at this time or around this time. The misfits, the misfits break up in at the end of October of 1983, but before that being around did you did you feel like the writing was on the wall in some way shape or form did you get a sense that the misfits might not be around too much longer uh um yes and no i know i know that they you know um glenn wanted to go in a different direction right and um you know and the other guys were wanting to work at their dad's place. Right. So, um, uh, you know. Right. I found it. Yes. Oh, so now we can do some friggin', uh, what's it called? Classic album shit where you solo out stuff and just hear it. All right, folks, we're in for a treat. All right. Oh, that's a demo of me and Glenn in my bedroom, but I can't play that. <laughs> so that's what I'm talking about, though. The you're, you're on drums, and he's just playing guitar, yeah. and it sounds right, like country. Go. Okay. So this is one track. Wow. You hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see the fader moving too. Here comes another track here. Can you hear the bass? Yeah. Well, so this is just the bass. Wow. Right? Yeah. And we to sleep as I did, and I live again. Beyond race, beyond religion, beyond man's fears. I am the end. Now is released. Now comes revenge. So I played that for Glenn over the phone, and I'm like, "You got to hear this." And he and he came over the next day with words, and we put it to that. And then I just did a bounce down, and then brought it to the studio, and um, uh, we just spliced it in before the song Sam Hain. Okay, wow. So I had always... Okay, thank you for setting the record straight because I had always thought that this was the very first sort of thing that had been done, but you guys had been recording all along. Yes. Um, so let me ask... Okay, two, all right, two follow-up questions. Question number one. So when does Erie come into the picture? Because the, it really starts to solidify when it's you, Erie... And Glenn, at some point, Rosemary's Babies breaks up, right? And then, um, I don't remember. Um, I think Glenn's like, we'll ask Erie to go on bass. He's got a good um, stage presence or something. So, something to gotcha. that effect. I don't know. Um, well, Erie and, didn't play bass. He didn't know how to play bass. And I think uh, Glenn and I taught him with uh, pictures of um, Erie would draw out these a scale on paper and draw the dots on the frets and stuff like that, I remember. Wow. But he picked it up pretty fast, I think. Um, and then 
here's okay so here's what's interesting and maybe you remember maybe you don't you guys played that first show in march at the ritz which is known as the rock hotel and you got lyle on it wasn't guitar. the ritz it was the rock hotel oh it was the rock hotel was separate from the ritz okay thank you so you have lyle on guitar you're in the middle of recording initium you've recorded some tracks there you probably you, you recorded for for a cu couple of months right the the total yeah. of initium so what what prompts the show which is an interesting show because a it has glenn on guitar which he would ditch very soon after b the lyrics there are different lyrics there's the, the songs are not songs weren't complete yeah what so what's that all about uh, I, I think i think we were just trying to we were trying to get a feel for what this was going to be mm. i think for for me and erie it was hard to understand what what this was right i mean because right. here we are with glenn from the misfits and and not only us but you know well i mean obviously we knew during rehearsals and recording that it was in misfits part two and that's glenn did not want that right but i think the everybody else want was expecting that right so it was kind of a shock in some ways right um so i think it was, it was a good test oh it's i mean I'm, I'm so glad it was recorded because it just shows you just see everything is sort of in flux and people were you know People were, of course, were expecting the Misfits Mach 2, so they're, you know, like sort of calling stuff out, and you're just kind of doing your thing and doing the songs, and the lyrics are different. It's it's really it really is something else, and I'm really glad that it exists. Truly, um, so you finish and in, Initium comes out. You do Initium. You start touring. Now, you guys were touring in a Spider-Man van. No, never. there was no Spider-Man van. That was the Misfits. That was the Misfits. Okay, so what is it? What is it like driving across the country in a van with no GPS, fucking hours so, at a uh, time? So we bought this truck from a. It was a. It was a box truck. So in the front, it looked like a, a van, right? The cab yeah. part looked like a van. Then it went up to a box. And we carpeted the inside and added a bunk and added some shelves. And it was the most uncomfortable thing ever. Oh, um, man. There was no windows in the back, only the windows in the front. And there was only a little door because we did that. So if, you know, you couldn't see the stuff, the, the equipment, um, so people couldn't, wouldn't break in. Right. Uh, <laughs> you, you think about it now, it's like, that was pretty fucked up at the time to do yeah. that in that way uh but the the van or truck wherever you want to call it belonged we bought it from a um a butcher so when we got it there was actually maggots in it holy crap from the the meat all the meat because they, they used to deliver meat that's so kind of on brand so we <laughs> literally kind of took a brand. hose on the yeah. inside with bleach and we sprayed the whole thing down and let it dry before we built everything actually Glenn was built the shelves. He was actually really good. He he understood. He knew how to build all that stuff. And then we did that come properly. from the Misfits from touring in the Spider-Man van with the Misfits, or he just decided that, or just seeing other guys do it, like other bands? Um, you know, he had already been I out. I don't think so. I, he just had it in him to do it. And we had this. I remember we had a blue this blue carpet. And of course, you know when you get new carpet, all the like that fiber stuff is. So, you know, we're wearing all black. We had all this fiber stuff all over us. <laughs> you needed the rollers. Yeah. You needed the rollers. Thank you. Thank you, Dagger Love. I just want to highlight Dagger Love for for uh, uh, sending a tip. Much appreciated. Um, that's amazing. So that's not easy. I mean, that is really not easy. You know, bands touring today. You got your cell phone. You can be absorbed in your phone. We have blah, blah, blah. Rand McNally maps. Wow. And you had to get to the gig, and it's like, oh, the gig starts in two hours, and the guy, the promoter, whoever on the phone, told us it was uh, uh, the, 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 to look for the blue door on the on the alleyway street on blah, 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 blah. You know, like he Sometimes, just... Sometimes, yes. 
crazy. Yeah. How did people get around anywhere in in a hurry? It just shit. What the hell did they do before cars? I, they got there. It's yeah. true. They they got there, and then what? I mean, what was that? Must have been very exhilarating. Or how was it? What was the difference playing in in Morning Noise to then playing in Sam Hain outside of the tri-state area and just like sort of expanding? Well, unfortunately, Morning Noise never played outside uh, Jersey or New York. Um, um, you know, it was surreal, right? I'm going on tour. Like, who doesn't want to go on tour if you're a musician? Right. So it was kind of, and of course, we we had, you know, we never had a bad crowd. It's not like we ever played to nobody. That wasn't the case. Right. Um, we were just, uh, we. so there was a built-in audience. So from the very beginning, I remember our very first show of the tour was in Pittsburgh at the Electric Banana. And, um, uh, in fact, we played there twice on two tours, but, uh, you know, you have all these people come and see you, but again, it was kind of interesting on what they were expecting. Uh, they were expecting the Misfits part two and that, but they weren't going to get it. Let's, let's talk, let's address this right now since, since you just got there. So the, this band, Sam Hain is so i mean we talk literally redundantly say this every fucking time we talk about sam Hain. super unique super out of the box just the you know completely anti you know what has been going on um, and playing with all this sort of cookie cutter hardcore or sometimes cookie cutter hardcore just this this very like sort of hardcore formula that had synthesized over the last few years starting in 1980 right um what like how do you like how do you describe the sam hain sound like how is it i think i might have even asked you that question before on the show so maybe you don't even have to answer that but like like what what is like you know pete said something that i thought was very interesting when i had him on the show this is what he said i don't know if you will agree or disagree with this but he but i found it profound pete damien the guitar the guitarist for sam hain he said that Sam Haynes' music is not really rooted in the blues. What do you think of a statement like that? Does that make sense? Is that crazy? Is that what? What? what do you, how do you look? I, I, look, I don't know if you if you if you listen to a song like um, the "Shift," it's dirgy blues. Um, but Whoa. again, um, that that's just my take on it. I don't know. I mean fuck do i know I, i'm not versed in in chord progressions and things like that right, right. Uh, so to say what's blues what what isn't you know glenn was trying you know if you notice on on uh, initium and unholy passion there's a lot of tom toms there's no a lot not a lot of hi-hat and like you know oh, top, oh, top. you know there's not there's none of that right and we were trying to break out of that mold, um, trying to sound somewhat different than everything else. A much right. darker thing than the Misfits would, would could ever be. And, you know, and that was the sound that we created. I mean... It had nothing to do with blues. I mean, it, it didn't have to. That's not what anybody was going for. It was... Again, you know, the songs and I mean, I have demos of these songs that are somewhat pretty true to what how they were on the album. But, um, you know, but he had it in his mind on um, what that was supposed to sound like. Now, when you say demos, these are like like four track, like we're just just so we know what the song is. Bedroom. We need to write. We're going to get the song. That was actually gonna be my next question was. When do you remember when Glenn goes, okay, guys, this is a song I call the shift. This is the howl. This is the, what might've been going on through your mind. Again, we're asking you to remember things that are, you know, from decades ago, but do you still remember? Yeah, anything yeah. Oh that... no, he had, um, he had titles for everything. Wow. Yeah. He definitely had titles. Um, 
Now, this is something that I get asked all the time on the show when we're talking about Sam Hain. It get asked it like every single time. So let me ask you. There's a song called I know what you think I'm gonna ask you. I'm not gonna ask you that. I'm gonna ask you something else. You don't even know what I'm gonna okay. ask you. All right, um, go ahead. um you have the shift, you have the howl, and then there's a third song called The Urge, supposedly. Supposedly, allegedly. What what what's up with this song? Is there a third is it a trilogy of werewolf songs? And the urge is the third in the trilogy of the <laughs> of the werewolf songs? I look you know, I, I've heard about this. We didn't record it that way. There might have been a take that we did that he was going to start doing something with, but nothing that was ever completed. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, so you're hearing these songs. You're hearing songs like All Murder, All Guts, All Fun, The Howl, The mm -hmm. Shift. Um, where And then also, so Archangel had existed as the oldest of the Sam Hain songs, and it existed all the way back in the Misfits, back when... Glenn, you know, Glenn was just didn't even know what Sam Hain would be yet. He just wanted to do something solo. Do you did you know anything about Archangel at first or before any of these other songs? Or did, was it like, hey, this is the first well, of this? Glenn had played me Archangel before uh, before we even started Sam Hain, hmm. you know, because he said he wanted that for Dave Vania, but that didn't work out. So. Then what we did was he wanted to redo it for Sam Hain. So we brought down the sessions and I tried to play to it, but it there was no click track used. So I'm like, let's because Glenn played the drums on that on in the miss on the original Misfits one. Huh. So I said, let's just use your drums. I mean, it made no sense because the timing kind of fluctuated and we didn't have digital back then, so you couldn't really sync it easily. So I'm like, let's just use yours. So that's Glenn's drums on that. So and Glenn that's is from playing... the original Misfits recording. What? Okay, wow. But did he not redid, know that. He did. The, we did. Uh, we redid the vocals, and we redid um, uh, bass and guitar. Why do I always feel like I'm hearing a saxophone on Archangel, even though there is no saxophone? No, there's no sax. But why? I'll tell Steve? you this much. <laughs> we did a mix, and we went and mastered the album. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I get home, and I put the album on, and we forgot to put the backup vocals in. So. Oh, man. We had to go back to the studio, oh. redo it, and pay for a whole other mastering session. So it was the wrong take. Can you explain? That was because of George Germain. God really? So he, yeah, he forgot to put the back of vocals in. Is so George? So George was like kind of engineering things as well. He was. He did somewhat. He um, again. He was a beaten guy who knew a little bit about everything. Right. Right. Um, and helped us a lot. You know, guided us. It, and, and same thing with Morning Noise. I mean, he helped us in the studio and got Bobby down to play some extra guitars and whatnot. Right. So that's pretty amazing. So, to, oh, no, that was what I was going to ask you about mastering. So what exactly, in, in a nutshell, without getting, because I'm sure you probably, I'm sure you could probably, it's it's a whole applied science. What is mastering, Steve? What what's the purpose of mastering? Why do you master you, something? When you, it, it's like um, I'm trying to. So it's like um, you finish your recording, right? Yeah. Now you can't take that recording and go right to a CD or an album because um, you want to make sure the levels of every song are the same, mm -hmm. right? And you put your final touch on your mastering, which could be compression. It could be equalization to EQ the entire mix mm -hmm. so that it all kind of sounds level. That's what mastering is. Gotcha. Um, so you're mastering stuff. It's, you know, back and forth. You got to go back and do it again. And then you go to the, pro we've all heard the pressing plant story mixing mix, you're not cleaning the stampers genius idea now these streaked vinyls go for thousands and thousands and well, thousands. it wasn't the stampers it was the vat 
So the vat. when you press the vinyl, vat. you have a vat. And the vat is this big machine, and they have pellets. And the, the pellets right. are your vinyl. They're little vi pl ru plastic pellets. And those pellets are come in bags, and you dump those bags into the vat. That heats it up. Right. And you pull down the lever, and out comes a glob of hot vinyl. Wow. Right? Uh, a, a, <laughs> hot plastic and yeah. you're going to take that and you have your you know your now your stampers are metal plates and you have side a and side b and they face each other and you take your labels your side a and your side b you put your label on you put your your glob of plastic and then the stampers come together right and it presses because the stampers have are metal and they have these the grooves the album it presses it down and now you have this album, you, they come up, and now you have this album with all this crap on it. So it's got to go to this other thing with a razor that gives you the right. fine round edge of an album or a right. 45. And you have that. It trims it, and then it goes through cooling, right, and then into the jacket. Who is, uh, out of curiosity, who is Lou Vomero? I'm getting this in, in the uh, John of Doom, John Voice of Doom is... Asking me uh, about Lou Vimero. Lou Vimero, um, he um, he used to own this sh uh, music shop called Music Man. At yeah. The, he had a really cool store. That's who Lou Vimero is. Hmm. Um, so let me jump back a bit. You Tell me about Bob Aleka and Real Platinum and going in there and setting up the drums for Sam Hain and what that whole process was like or what was like work with Bob? Um, Bob Alecker was his jazz guy. Right. He opened the studio in his parents' basement. I happened to open the local um, music uh, paper of New Jersey at the time. And I saw this advertisement for a studio in Lodi. I'm like, wow, a studio in Lodi. So I called up and I rode my bicycle down to it wasn't wasn't far from uh where i lived and went to his house and he had this little studio in his basement so um that's where when um that's where we recorded uh the morning noise stuff most of it and um i i turned uh bobby Steele onto it and we recorded some stuff there and then i also uh i told Glenn that at that point uh, it was only eight track and then he bought this big machine and made it a 16 track so we recorded Nishium as 16 track and then he expanded it to 24 track and that's what we did on Holy Passion on was 24 track and at that point he built this huge mixing board in 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 the studio and then eventually I mean it was very small he wouldn't let me use my own drums. I had to use his drum kit, which was this really small kit. And I, I hated the sound. Um, I, I thought the sound on, on an, on Initium drums and on Holy Passion was quite terrible to be honest with you. Huh. Um, but not terrible enough. I got a call one night from Erie. And Metallica had just played the the uh, arena in Jersey. This is late eighties, maybe. Mm -hmm. And here we go. Somebody wants to talk to you, so he puts Lars on the phone. And Lars <laughs> goes, "Oh, dude, I just want to tell you how much I really like the drum sound, the initium." I, I go, "Yeah, I know, dude. It sucks." He goes, "No, no, no. I really like that kick sound. How'd you do it?" I'm like, "Dude, it's just like a lot of muffling and compression and." Uh, the next metallic album came out and it sounded just like that i'm like oh god it's listen it's dead whether you like it or hate it steve it's very unique and you don't hear a lot of drums sound like that so yeah well you know there was no sampling back then so 
Let me ask you this. Thank you, Dagger Love. Thank you again uh, for the support. Let me ask you this, Steve. Um, you you mentioned eight tracks, sixteen tracks, twenty four tracks, and I'm think I'm I'm suddenly trying to visualize both Initium and Unholy Passion and where the budget, the track budget goes. How many tracks are for this? How many tracks are for that? Yada uh, yada yada. We, we we didn't think we didn't really think that. I mean, we knew there'd be this many, a few guitars, a track of bass. You know, uh, we were kind of new at the recording thing, doing it, doing it ourselves. George helped us, but um, it, you know, obviously, you know, we had this guy, um, Mike Gatilla. We wanted these chime sounds on the record, and the keyboard that we used had just come out. You couldn't, they couldn't make them fast enough. So we had to call this session guy, and, and he wouldn't even let Glenn play it. He had to play it, which is why he got credited on the record. Uh, and I huh. forgot how much we paid him to come in with his keyboard. $149. And... <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so that was interesting. And by the time we did Unholy Passion, you know, the key, the studio owner had already got one. So we didn't have to, you know, rent anything. The drums on Unholy Passion are insane. Like literally insane. Like I don't know. They're better than Initium, that's for sure. But like the stamina that must be required, not even just in the studio, but live to to play a song like that, it can't be easy. It just it can't be easy. What what's the? Let me ask you this: What are, in your opinion, from what you remember, what were the most taxing Sam Hain songs? What are the songs, or, or is it all effortless for you? Is it all just? I don't know. We just did it. I mean, yeah. uh, I think I am misery was probably the most taxing song. Maybe. Hmm. Interesting. Now, I, again, I don't like the way they were recorded to me. It didn't capture the true feeling of how we did it live. Again, the, 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 the recording the where the, the drums were, it was a very confined space. So right. I literally had to keep my, elbows to my side and it was it wasn't very comfortable where it was like <laughs> my own studio you know i can right. tell you I, I have plenty of room you do um, you have plenty of room you know he's got a room for the drums i do so if we look in here oh this boy is my drum room so show, there's plenty. show him the light steve if you can, what? if you have access, the, the the lights they change color, don't they? Oh like yeah, I, I, it's the app on my phone. Oh, you got to use uh, the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so it. you know, we have plenty of stuff all over. We have different drum kits we could use and stuff like that. Um, right, you have more, way more room. Yeah. But now yeah. this is what's interesting: what you're saying about being cramped, because now you are. Is that going to, that's obviously going to affect the way that the drums are going to sound. You're not going to hit the drums in the same way that you are going to hit them if you have more right. space. I, you know, I, I'm a, um, I'm no virtuoso on drums, but I like to swing my arms because yeah. that's, you know, uh, but you couldn't do that. You were like very confined. That's so weird. So. That's so crazy. Um, so let me ask you this. What is, as, as the misfits, uh, die and Sam Hain is born plan nine records has turned into this really insane sort of operation where, you know, I mean, Glenn is running a record label and he's got like a thriving business on some level where he's, people are, are ordering t-shirts and records and things from him. What do you remember about the state of Plan Nine in '84 and '85 and whatnot? Uh, he, you know, he, he was, you know, Glenn's always been an entrepreneur. You know, um, he was always coming out with new shirt designs and selling albums and and whatnot. So posters. Wow. Do you remember? legacy of brutality being prepared and master getting ready was that were you still around when that was happening or was that after no, you were gone that was after that was after you were gone uh did you know 
that he was planning to do some sort of compilation or sort of put something together or was that just a complete shock to see I, legacy I think, come out? I think that was partially because of uh caroline records gotcha gotcha um and then you you make your exit but here's what i want to know where where does danzig the band and just sort of all that stuff where is that in your periphery throughout the years until you kind of start to come back into the picture in 99 like you see like was it a shock to you to to hear that sam hayne is turning into a band called danzig like do you remember anything about that or what when, when we were trying to come up with a name for the band yeah i said why don't we just call it danzig oh right and from the get-go yep and wow. he didn't want to do that um he wanted it to be something else. So we picked Sam Hain. We There was a bunch of different names that um, went around. But... Um, you remember any of the well, other names? I do, but I'd rather not say right now. Fair enough. Fair enough. Carry on. Um, I, I, when it morphed into Danzig, is that what you're asking? Uh, just like, okay, so you, you, you left the band and... I'm talking about like in, yeah, like in like eighty six, eighty seven. When I, when I left the band, I I said, look, I'll do any shows if you want. I'll you know until right. you get my replacement. And I recommended London, right? Um, because I had met London a few times. He had put on a show um, in Maryland. He's um, on that video. On the video, <laughs> um, and I thought London was a, a great drummer, and I knew he would fit. You know. Right. With the band, and I thought he would be a perfect, you know, match, which he was. Um, and then from there, you know, I, I knew it was a matter of time until Glenn was going to, you know, it was like the Misfits held Glenn back, which is why he did Sam Hain, right? Right. And then Sam Hain was kind of holding back for the next part right. of the legacy which would right. be dancing right which is more blues based now so. was that shocking to hear because i'm sure you must have either either some you got a copy or someone passed you a tape or you picked it up yourself was it shocking at the time to hear danzig compared to something like sam hayne unholy passion or november coming fire i mean it must have been crazy to like hear the, the transformation well, glenn gave me a copy i you gotta yeah. remember i stayed friends with glenn um, oh see i didn't know that i i don't know anything about that time. it was only like a year afterwards that we didn't talk and gotcha you know um but um no, I um, he gave me a copy of the first Danzig album, and I wasn't what I would expect, you know, because at that point it was produced. You know, Rick Rubin right. produced that album. Yeah, it, it you know Rick Rubin's favorite band was ACDC, so right. it was very dry. Not what I was used to. Vocals very dry. Right, you know. Um, so I, I at the beginning I was kind of like, this is interesting. You know, it had to grow on me. Right. And then of course once uh, Lucifuge came out, I was like, man. By the time they did Danzig Four, to me there were songs on Danzig Four that could have been Sam Hain songs. You know what? What now? I always hear this. I always hear, oh, Danzig Four, Secret Sam Hain album. What 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 songs or is there any song that you off the top of your head if you can think of something that might be invocative of sure Sam can't Hain, speak like, can't speak wow okay I'm gonna give um, I'm gonna give it a listen I'm gonna give it another listen that that um, that that's one with the, they did the video they did like the tool video for that I don't crazy mind video the pain. oh I don't mind the pain hmm it's a great song that also had a music video wow yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and then you're doing stuff at this. You're also doing stuff. You, I don't know. I, I don't even know if you want to talk about this band, but 
If you do, no, you do. I if don't. you don't, no, you don't. Um, so then, uh, uh, I, I, I did. I became jaded at some, not jaded. Jaded is the wrong word. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Okay. At that point in my life. Gotcha. So I, I got involved uh, with some people, and we did some songs yeah. and music. Right. Um, and it was just it was just easy to do. Not. I can't say I'm proud of it. I don't okay. like to look back on it, to be honest with you. Fair enough. It's not my favorite. It wasn't true to me. And it was always a, it seemed more of a job than it was, uh, it should have been a band. Mm. It just wasn't cohesive. You know, mm. we um, just too many hands in the pot. Right. People no solid vision. People wanting more about, I can't hear my part. It was more about the part than it was the song. And, you know, so that's why it's not even worth giving it a mention. Fair enough. Moving on. So then the the box set is due to come out. The Misfits are the Misfits box Which that box comes set? out. Well, no, first the Misfits box that comes out. Mm -hmm. Collection two comes out. Jerry and Doyle are doing their whole circus. Um, there's all this, Glenn is, you know, at the top of his, you know, pop powers with, you know, he's at the top of the charts with mother is as high as he would ever go. I mean, 1994, 95 is when like this, you know, you get this huge sort of recognition, you know, where he's like kind of like really bursting out of the, the seams with mother and everything. And then, um, and then the misfits coming along or the, the resurrected, whatever you want to call them, Mrs. Come along. And then there's a Sam Hain box set. That comes out, and well, the, the Sam Hay box that didn't come out till ninety nine. Is it ninety nine or two? I think two thousand. Okay, and you know, that's when. But you did reunion shows in ninety nine. Yes, and that was to sort of bring what? What was the purpose of the reunion shows in relation to the box? Uh, set? I think Glenn just missed doing Sam Hain songs. Yeah, and um, it was a good opportunity to do it. And then you you start to do this sort of other thing, this son son of Sam. What is the? I, I know you've answered this question before, but like, what is son of Sam? Is sort of an attack. It's not. Uh, Todd was the. It, how does all right? Just explain how, how does that all so, happen. Originally, Pete was supposed to do the Sam Hain reunion. Uh, <laughs> What happened was Pete was playing with Iggy Pop and it conflicted. And it wasn't worth it for Pete to do a few months where he was going to lose all this other work with Iggy. Right. So the easiest thing at the point at that time was using Todd, who was in Danzig at the time, to play guitar. Um, AFI was one of the bands that opened up for us on the West Coast run of the tour. So half the tour was hate breed and half the tour was AFI. So um, London had was friends with Davey and the band. And Davey was a big fan of, of all things dancing. So um, it was London's idea to put this together. And we spoke to Todd and... Um, Spoke to Davey, and he was into it. And we, um, there were some cassette tapes that, this was pre-MP3 that went back and forth. And right. Todd put together. And myself, London, and Todd got together in a rehearsal studio in Hollywood about a day or two before we went in the studio out in California. I flew out there. And um, we recorded it over a weekend. We picked Davey up from the airport one day. We had no idea what he was going to sing. And he came in and did his vocals. And that was that. He came in with those lyrics? Wow. Amazing. Yeah, we had no idea what his melodies were going to be or anything. Wow, you had just sort of come up with this music or you were just doing this music and just sort of... Yeah. Uh, it's a really cool yeah. album. A lot of people... It's a, a very beloved album and whatnot. And that brought... You guys were on Nitro Records with that, which was... Um... Yeah, so originally, it was our idea to ask Maurice, De a.k.a. Devilman, yeah. to fund a 45 for us. Uh, Davey had told... Um, 
Brian Holland, a.k.a. Dexter, from mm-hmm. The Offspring, who owned Nitro Records, about it. And he says, well, I'll just give you guys a deal. Wow. So go and do a whole album. So, so uh, that 45, that, that Devil Man was would have uh, uh, financed, would that have been, that would have also included Davey, or it was just, it was just yeah. meant to be one yeah, yeah. or two songs or something like that? Well, we had only meant it to do a few songs, again, as a 45, but right. again, like I said, you know, and... Um, Fascinating. Yeah. That's crazy. And, you know, you got, you, you did a, the second one came out and... Um, you yeah, started I, I mean, uh in in hindsight I should have never let it happen. Um London didn't join it because Davey wasn't allowed to join it because of his contractual obligations to AFI and and I think whatever record label AFI was on at the time after Nitro. And I got swindled by Todd. Oh blah 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 blah. And not that it's a bad album by any means. Um but it wasn't the same. That was his um, guy. His yeah. guy came in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you start playing with Glenn again. But let me ask you about this. You well, that that happened a little bit before. But let me ask you this: What was your reaction? Or it must have blown your hair back to just see that to see Glenn and Doyle starting to do these shows because it was right before you would come back into the fold i mean that must have been crazy considering that it was literally like impossible you know the idea of 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 glenn and jerry doing anything together was impossible but the fact that glenn is a now he's like after a whole decade of like don't ask me a thing about the misfits now i'm gonna do this set of songs i'm doing it with doyle i mean that must have been crazy for you as a misfits fan or just whatever. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was great. I got I went to see a bunch of the shows mm-hmm. when they came around. Right. Um, I, I I thought it was a lot of fun. I, I I remember that's when you know that was on my radar at the time it was happening. I thought it was I thought it was crazy too, man. I was like, you know. And then we get, of course, the reunion, and we we get a proper reunion where we see the the you and i were both at that the the best show that they have done up to this point i think at least of all the shows and probably will do i think it's the best one the 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 msg show is just was just absolutely unparalleled yeah i don't think it was a great show it was a really really great show and um and now you're doing black 29 tell me about the sort of genesis of black 29 for people who don't know black well you go ahead you tell me steve tell me about black well, 29. so you know prior to black 29 i had marriage drug right right and um we put out a few cds and, and they were good i'm i'm actually proud of them um and i think what happened was there were expectations by some of the members that i should be pretty much doing everything um getting shows and whatnot and why didn't success come faster and there was some things where well you get to go out and play with dancing in front of thousands of people Mm. so there was kind of some jealousy thing so it it just you know when a band starts becoming bullshit it's no longer a band it's bullshit and it's not fun so um one guy's like, I don't want to do it. I just want to go play cover songs. And I'm like, okay, well, all right. So now it's me and Dan, bass player. And Dan-o. He, he came over and um, Dan, I know, played bass. I knew he played some guitar, but so I said, you know what? Let's write a song. I have a studio, so let's write and record a song. So he's like, okay, so came down and it was effortless. So we put a song down and then we put another and another. I'm like, I didn't know you were this good on guitar. And uh, he became like one of my favorite gu- guitar players. And um, so it just kind of morphed into its own thing. So, um, you know, we put out a CD and the next one's coming out on Cleopatra in the new year. Congratulations. It's wonderful. Thank you. And um, uh, we have a video coming 
along with it. Thanks we, to a very special person. This is true. Not the first time either. No, that's right, because you did the, the first video for Black 29. I, You know, uh, I got to tell you, I really, really I don't want to blow smoke up my own ass, but I really like that video. I'm in, you, so do I don't I. know how. Oh, you do? Okay, cool. Yeah, I do. I, I really thought that video came out so good for what, like, just. We, we did just the went, flashlight. Yeah, we just did. A, we did this flashlight in that a was dark in my room. Old condo. Yeah, we went to Steve's old condo. We did a flashlight on the wall and I got to I shot it with a DSLR and I have to tell you I mean it was it was just pure like you know collaboration DIY ingenuity and you know and then I started keying out the black and it was pulling it out and coming back in it was just it, I just really happy with the, how it came out you could see that on Steve's YouTube channel you could see it on my YouTube channel and uh we got another one coming for it for uh real soon so it's in this, this, it's cooking. this one's gonna be fun yeah, and I, and I, you know, and it's a cover song. Yes, um, that's true. And uh, but it, I think it's pretty cool. So, yeah, I, it, I gotta tell I, you, every time I listen to it, it grows on me more and more and more and more. Like truly, you know. Yeah. You know. Um, so, let me let me ask you this. I'm sorry, I keep cutting you off. Okay. Um, tell me about. Uh, tell me this question, and then let's go to a couple of Q and A's. We'll, we'll we'll land the airplane. We'll wrap things up. Um, do, what, tell me about the feeling, cause you have built a studio and you, you're, you're, you've done some producing and some engineering and stuff, a bunch of stuff. And I, you know, guys, and I'm real. And again, now I'm going to blow some smoke up of Steve's ass, but I'm not doing it because Steve is my friend and I like Steve. I'm doing it because I legitimately 100% was blown away. He showed me some stuff that he was engineering uh, of this other project he was working on. And I was just really blown away by what, how Steve, he was producing too, and how he just sort of um, envisions something. He goes, oh, this needs this. And then he puts it on the thing and it just transforms the track and the sound. And you're doing this all from your own studio. What is it, how does it feel to just sort of, you know, put something together like a place, a space, a creative space, and then, you know, do your project, do other people's projects or what, what, however that works. And just what, tell me about that, that uh, feeling. You know, I, I bought this house um, two years ago um, in December. It's two years and moved here. Um, and, you know, every house that we looked for, I needed obviously needed a space for a studio. And um, so... I got to thank Tommy Kaprowski from Morning Noise. Uh, Tommy's a, a professional painter, but he's also very good with carpentry. So he helped me um, uh, put in a bathroom. He helped me. Um, the it, scariest bathroom you. ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. The ejector pump. <laughs> um, so like... Um, you see all these sound treatments on the walls so i made these and so tommy helped me hang them and when it came to the drum room the drum room didn't exist so when i uh did the chromags uh 2020 um ep i didn't have a what happened was COVID hit and i've done sound for chromags a bunch of times and I was supposed to do sound for them opening up for body count and the show got canceled two nights before due to COVID being mm -hmm. the city shut down. So I engineered their live. Um, we were probably the first band to do a live webcast at the very beginning of COVID and you could check it out. Oh, I've seen that. It, look, it looks great. To me, it sounds really good. We, yeah. we literally went in and, you know, I had to mix it through headphones cause I was right in the same room. Uh, but, um, so Harley's drummer, great, uh, Gary G man Sullivan was stuck. He lives, he's from, um, Brooklyn or Bronx and, but he was stuck in, in the States till September cause he couldn't, they closed the borders. So Harley's like, well, I have him here. I might as well do some recording, but we couldn't find a recording studio cause he wanted me to engineer it. So I wasn't set up yet cause I was only here three or four months. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll hook everything up. Come on in. 
and let's record. Wow. So I, I just did a makeshift drum area. Yeah. So then um, afterwards, it'll be a year in a few weeks, I convinced Tommy to help me build my drum room. So this room was not here. This whole thing was not here. <laughs> yes. So um, I, Tommy came down and um, we basically built built out this whole room, uh, just him and I. And wow. um, yeah, so. And, Fantastic. Um, came out pretty damn good. So I have treatments on the walls so that if I want less reflection, I pull the curtains to get more reflection. Explain reflection. Better, I just, huh? Reflection Ex is the the sound that hits the way it hits the microphones. Right. So on on a drum kit, right? You have all different microphones. You have mm -hmm. overheads. Mm -hmm. You have mics on each tom, mm -hmm. and snare, and hi hat, and ride cymbal, and two mics on the kick drum. So, you know, um, you know, wires that run through the walls. So, and what's the and, thing uh, you have, the, the, the tube, you have a tube that makes it go, the sound goes through the tube and then like, it's some sort of base. It's like a base tube or something. What is it called? Remember the thing? The base tube. It's like a tube oh, the or subwoofer? something. Is it a subwoofer? I don't know. It's just like a tube that... It takes, it percolates the sound. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean? Like it sends the sound in, and then it just. I, don't, I have, a, I have a lot of shit here. Yeah, he's got, he's got toys. I you have, have toys. Uh, Harley's bass. Yeah. I have the Harley's amp. Talk about here. trial by fire, just to like, hey, let's set up a studio and and track the new Chromags. Boom. Yeah, it, it worked. We 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 yeah. got it done, and. Um, so uh, we'll stu we'll soon um, start the next Chromags album here. Very cool, very so. very cool. Let's um let's wrap this up with a couple of because we've ignored the comments the whole time and I did that on purpose, guys. I'm sorry. You know how chat I'm a chatty Kathy normally and we go into the comments, but I really want to didn't want to interrupt the flow of conversation with Steve. Um, so let's take some comments. So now is the time to ask uh appropriate questions if anybody wants to ask any questions and i want to thank dagger love as well as um undead oh where where did he go where did he go undead 797 um for the for your support really appreciate really appreciated um chris is asking uh during rosemary's baby's years did eerie work weird hours in a chemical factory or something and he would hang out late at night at glenn's place and watch old tv shows i don't know if he hung out at glenn's but he did work for he would uh there was a place called steppen chemical company eerie worked there made good money and would ride his bike home and glenn and i would be waiting for him to get home so we could rehearse hmm. in his basement um, Rue once again wants to know when the new Black Twenty Nine is dropping, and I I heard you say it before, but I, always good to say it again. Yeah, I would see if we're in, in November. I'm going to say April, hopefully. Okay, that's good. Um, I'm getting asked: uh, Are there any lost Sam Hain songs? Um, no. No, there you go. Mm -mm. There you've heard it. Heard it here from the from the source. B Mac. All right, this guy's great because this guy he likes to watch the show in his hot tub. He just hangs out in the hot tub, watches the show in a hot tub. His name's Hot Tub Rob. He was at the Danzig Sings Elves. He wants to know why Sam Hain isn't on Spotify. B Mac, thank you for the support. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know why is Sam Hain not on Spotify. Uh, we're trying. There you go, guys. They're trying to get it on there. There you go. They're trying. Um, runner dial zero. Windigo never got vocals. Aw, shit. I don't. I think Steve wasn't around for that. So that was after. Um, Joel Black asks any record releases of your stuff. I'd love a copy of Runaway. Any plans to repress something like that, Steve? Yes. Ah, that's Cleopatra. awesome. 
Cleopatra will be re-releasing the Runaway 45. Um, what is the story behind the Runaway cover, I'm being asked? So, in 1984 or 85, um, I wanted to go to, I was always interested in uh, recording. And I wanted, I was going to, I really wanted to go to school in Manhattan, um, the School of Visual Arts. SVU, so, SVI. Uh, they had a good recording program there. So um, I was, I had called the studio owner, Bob Aleka at Real Platinum to ask him about it. And he said, yeah, he said, it's good. It's expensive. He said, but I'll tell you what, why don't you come in? I'll give you a break on studio time. You record a song, but you're going to be hands on. So I can hmm. teach you because he says everything you can learn, you know, a lot via books and stuff and the theory but really recording is about listening and being hands-on so i said okay so um uh morning was it was already broken up so i was talking to the former singer mike and he's like well i have a song uh that i'd like to do i said okay so we split the studio time the cost and got Chris on bass and Chris's brother, uh, Mike Morantz, on uh, keyboards, guitar. And um, it was my first time ever trying to sing. And I always liked that song from when I was a kid. So I'm like, why not? Nikki Coro is asking, what did Glenn exactly design on the Morning Noise album cover? the cover <laughs> whoa that was a curtain. quick one he drew the curtains and the bats he drew all that cool um how was oh oh here's something did you ever see the unholy passion cover without the weird black bars covering something up there's a there's more to the image do you know anything about this or is that nothing that you might remember nope no, okay remember. um any more Elvis shows? I hope so. Hey, were, he hopes so. I, I had a great time. He had a great time. Um, we already saw that question. Already saw that question. I'm skipping over anything we're done. I'm scrolling back up. Let's see if we have anything else here. I think I showed you last week. I was actually going to, and I do a fundraiser to help feed um, people who can't afford to eat and right. battered woman shelter. So I was going to take mm -hmm. this drum head and and auctioned it off and i said to glenn will you sign the drum head because if we could you know be great because i wrote my set list on the on the snare drum head just break this down one more time for everybody because it's cool what you did on this drum head well because i can't see far and like if you'll notice when danzig plays my our set lists are huge so i can see them right if you put it on the floor i can't see that so they have to make them really big for me um but so I just thought it's so much easier writing the songs on the snare head and I can write my, my notes as well, what I sticks I was going to use. And then I, he signed it like this. <laughs> to Steve, love ya. Glenn Danzig. That tricky old Glenn. That's my buddy. That's your buddy. Um, hold on. I'm trying to see if there's any other things. Steve, I want to thank Steve so much, truly, for coming on this channel. I mean, he's he's popped on, on several times before, but we've never had him formally as a guest and sit down and do a Sam Hain thing. We spoke to Pete, and it was very good to hear Steve's point of view and Steve setting the record straight on a bunch of things as well. So I really want to thank Steve so much jody is asking jody who's always here is asking what's your favorite misfit song and sam hain song steve <laughs> uh misfit song i guess it would have to be who killed marilyn oh okay um yeah i think who killed marilyn is probably one of my favorites um 
hard to say, you know, because there's so much good. Um, every song on Static Age is, is great. But Who Killed Marilyn just has, I don't know, just has this thing. All right. Um, oh, Dagger Love is asking legacy song. What is your favorite song off of Legacy of Brutality? Uh, American Nightmare is on there, right? Yeah. Yeah, American Nightmare. Makes sense. Makes sense for sure. Um, hold on. Let's see if there's any. Let's do one more. Let's do one more. <laughs> Noodles. This guy Noodles is such a funny guy. Was the... Okay, here we go. Here's the final question. A question that Steve probably gets sick and tired of answering, but let's ask it to him anyway. Uh, Dan no. asks... The answer is no. Boom. There you go. <laughs> There you go. Nice and nice, short and sweet. The answer is no. Well, I, I don't know what the question was. But... Oh, I thought you were. <laughs> the question is, uh, was the 30th anniversary show the true end of Sam Hain or is there a possibility for Sam Hain shows for the 40th coming up soon? I thought it was seven years ago, right? So already. Um, seven years ago. I I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, look, never say never, but everybody's so busy. Like we have to, we have to tour Danzig. We have to, there's Glenn in the movies. There's Glenn in the Misfits. There's Glenn in, you know, so I don't know if there's time or space, um, you know, I don't know. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Guys, keep your eyes peeled for the new Black 29 that's coming out on Cleopatra Records. We have a music video to go with it. And for a very interesting cover, as Steve said, it is a surprise as of right now. Um, Which also features Johnny Kelly. Right. Who and else is Johnny on it? Victor. Okay. And uh, <laughs> doing guest vocals with me yeah. on it is Yerky69 from the 69 Eyes. That's right. That's right. So we had. So it's a whole. It's a. It's 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 a. There's you got a lot of uh, guest stars up in there. It's really great. Uh, I think people are going to really enjoy it. And uh, so keep your eyes peeled for that. I want to thank Steve one more time for coming on. Steve, we will uh, definitely be well, in touch I, real I, soon. I got to thank you. Obviously, you know, um, you like um, uh, Maurice. And a few others that really have taken your time in all things Danzig and all things related to all of our projects. You know, we all appreciate it. I personally appreciate everybody out there that that follows us and comes to our shows and, you know, and supports all of our other endeavors. It means a lot. It's, um, you, you know... Uh, you know, don't forget, you know, morning noise. You'll hear some new stuff come out too in the new year. Right. Uh, we, right. We, um, you know, it's, um, it's going to be a good year. Yeah. Yeah. That is, I, I, I concur. I, I, I agree. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff to look forward to. Truly. Truly. Yeah. So, yeah, but thank you, Jeff, for again hey. for your support and oh, and uh, my pleasure. Doing your homework. I I really you know I, I I pride myself on two things. I try to do my homework, and I never claim to be an authority. I always try to go into something not totally one hundred percent sure that I know what it is because I wasn't around. And how could I actually know? I gotta you know you cross cross check. Try and you know, <laughs> try and uh, figure figure that stuff out. You know, it's not well, easy. From the time I met you, when you when you contacted me about it, <laughs> I think it was about doing the interview for your original project that you started yes. years ago. Yes, I was very um, I was very surprised at the amount of um, of people that you had contacted that were part of the movement from the mid to late 70s yeah which was 
you know, a big deal. Uh, and that, to me, was that set everything in motion. You know what's so, funny about uh, that? Confession, on-air confession, people. That you said to me, we, I think we met at, we met at the Congress Theater in Chicago. Yes. And you just, you know, you know, Steve's some, sometimes if you're lucky, you might catch Steve walking around doing his thing. And so I was, I, we, we, I, I made contact with Steve and he asked me who you got. And I, as soon as he said that I had all this footage that I had not touched yet. And I put together this thing to show Steve that I meant business. But up until that point, I had nothing put together. I had to put it all together to show Steve so that uh, I, I could progress and potentially interview him for said project at that time. And uh, it was, a, a, it was a trial by fire, putting it all together in hopes that he would agree to do it. So uh, I'm always eternally grateful for your time at that time, especially it's a huge uh, 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 breath in my sails. So guys, thank you so much. I got, I, you know what? I have to ask you a question. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> Maybe you might know. Sure. Try me. What does Cardi sugar bowl have to do with anything? Cause I brought this up to Glenn last week and Glenn's like, I have no idea because I remember going there a few times as a kid, but I'll tell you. Okay. So here from a fan perspective, from like, uh, here's the thing. And, and maybe this doesn't make sense to you because you're from Lodi, but Lodi has earned this almost. I, I mean, I, I don't, maybe I'm speaking out of turn here, possibly even international reputation in the realm of people who know punk rock music as this is the place where the misfits came from. Now let's contextualize this, Steve, you know, Forest Hill Queens because of the Ramones, but you Ramones. ask any, yeah, but if you ask any casual Ramones fan, Hey, do you know where the Ramones come from? They might say, Oh, uh, uh, New York, maybe like they know that New York, nobody, not everybody knows Forest Hill Queens. If you ask where's the Sex Pistols from, they might say London. No one's going to say Kings, the Kings Road or that that's uh, uh, sex shop, the Malcolm McLaren sex shop. Yeah, same thing. Maybe some people are going to know where Black Flag from Hermosa Beach, but that's really it. Nobody there. There is no place that is more synonymous with a punk band emerging out of. A but situation. I still want to. I still want to know what Cardi Sugar. Bowl. I'm getting no, there, I, Steve. I went to Cardi I'm getting there. Go ahead. So, the thing is, so this place, this town, captures the imagination because, for whatever reason, myself included, we, those of us who were not there, you experienced it. But for those of us who were not there at that time did not we we don't really know the difference so to us it's like getting to touch down and be in con like for instance why do people like why do people like props why do people like memorabilia because it's it creates a bridge a connection but to that Lord thing Lord that Lord they Pizza, love i don't understand what cardi sugar i'm, I'm getting steve there i'm steve. getting there steve well get there because steve, because because, because cardi's because cardi's is a staple an institution within the town of lodi where which has become this place for certain groups of fans to make these pilgrimages to you go there and you go to these landmarks and you go and you see the hold on hold on you see the posters you go in there you see the posters hanging up on the wall you see the three hits from hell posters you know benson who runs cardi sugar bowl benson he's the He's the, uh, his father opened up Cardi's the, uh, and then Benson took over Cardi's and I think he's leaving it for his daughter or whatever. He went to high school with Jerry's dad. They were in the same class in Lodi high school. He is just a staple of Lodi. So when people come to Lodi to sort of like soak up 
whatever it is in that air, in that area, that suburban, whatever it is, they stop at Cardi's because a, it's a place that has, it's like an old timey place. You know, it's a, it's a penny candy store. There are not many around, you know, Lodi has definitely changed over the years, as I'm sure you're aware of, but that's a place that's still there. And that's a place where the misfits used to hang stuff up or that, that, that they would get stuff and they would hang, hang it up. It's the same thing as St. Mark's. I'll never forget when I used to walk down St. Mark's 20 years ago and I'd always walk by this old rusted door. And you know what I saw at the bottom? I saw a fiend club with the skull. I saw it stencil spray painted there. And I remember where, where I had read somewhere about how the misfits would take anybody's leather jacket and they would spray paint the stencil onto the leather jacket. And it just, the idea that somebody in the band or somebody that was in the periphery of the band might have spray painted the, this stencil there and left the mark and that it was still there decades later and that now I'm walking by it and I see it and that's my connection to that time and place. Does that answer your question, Steve? Uh, uh, <laughs> that's a fucking long drawn out explanation which i still don't get i went there one time and you know i went there why i went there yeah because i'm like after everybody you know and i grew up in lodi but it was like it meant nothing to me i mean um i went there maybe four or five years ago for the first time yeah just to see what it was about I'm like, yeah i don't know it's just it's 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 just like it's a part of Go to Lodi Pizza. Yeah, of course. Everybody goes to Lodi Pizza, too. Well, the, keep going. They have the great, greatest pizza in the world. Yeah, so, you know, there's also, you know, we were at the VFW last week, and or last Saturday, and it was, we had a great time. There was a show. It was a lot of fun. Some bands played, and there were a lot of people. I was just at Cardi's, and, you know, I don't know what it is. It's just it's just a it's just <laughs> part of the identity. Question. What? What did you do at Cardi's? What do you mean? <laughs> what when i what went there do? i bought some candy i bought some penny candy and i looked at the posters on the walls he's got some cool shit up on those walls he's got like from when john lennon died like in 1980 december 9th 1980 he has like the original newspaper clipping hanging up on the wall in there okay you know i, I didn't know that i have you let me ask you steve when you went there did you did you stare up at the at the ceiling when you were in there no. Well, that's your problem. You got to go back in oh, there. You got to stare at the that, ceiling. That's, you know, that's the answer to your question. I'm that's glad the answer you told me what my problem was because I wasn't sure it was. You know, you have to look up at the ceiling. Planet, and I'm, now I know what my problem is. <laughs> dude, Thank if you, you look up, if you look what up, a at, session. dude, if you look up on the I have ceiling. A couch here. I think next time you come over, I'll lay on the couch and you can tell me what my problem is. I, I will. I'll bring a clipboard and we will talk. <laughs> We will we will get to the bottom of everything, Steve. Truly, <laughs> well, I think we just did. Yes, because you just told me what my problem was. Listen, that's because I didn't stare at the ceiling. If next time you go into Cardi's, the first thing you're going to do, Steve, is you're going to look up at the ceiling, and everything will make sense for you. I promise. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh man, uh, listen, okay. I'll be in touch with you real soon about you things. Got it. Thank you so much, Steve. Really appreciate it. Truly, thank you. you got thank it, you brother. for this. Take care. Thank you. Peace everyone. and hair grease. Bye. Bye. Wow, guys. What a friggin' interview that was. I just want to I want to apologize again. I I try, you know, I tried to get to some of the comments. It's not easy when, you know, again, I don't want to interrupt the flow of conversation and it's just it's tough. It's tough, but I see all of you in the comments and I'm glad you all enjoyed it as much as as I did ballad. And I, I saw Amy, I think. Um, and Rue and Dagger Love and Daniel, all you guys, truly. Th this was a really fun Felipe's here. Chris Morantz. It was so, you know, I finally got to meet Chris for the first time. It was really nice to meet him. We were, we did this Lodi show at the VFW. We didn't even get a chance to really talk about it. I got to tell you, it was so much fun. Robbie Bloodshed, Voice of Doom, and Tony Matura's Secret Subway. And I was like the MC kind of guy. And it was just it was just a lot of fun. Um, I got to say, 
Uh, Robbie performed some gr- uh, a really interesting secret set. And, you know, Voice of Doom really blew me away, man, with their live sound. Go see Voice of Doom if you have a chance. Go see all those guys if you have a chance. Robbie and, and Tony Matura. Um, uh, John, I saw John in the comments as well. John, Voice of Doom, John, that we always speak to on the thing. He was, man, he really uh, commanded the stage. Um, I'm going to, a whole video of that VFW show will be coming out on the channel. It's not like the show itself, but like, you know, just a bunch of, like a like a vlog sort of thing. And uh, for those of you who joined late, I really, really, really recommend that you go back to the beginning of this video and just watch from the beginning. This is a really good video. If it's your first time on this channel, please make sure to like, share, and most of all, subscribe. And the last thing I want to tell you while I have you all here, this is very important. I have a sponsor now that I, it's a, it is, um, the, 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 the ink is not dry yet, but I have my first sponsor and I'd like to tell you a little bit about them. They are called riot stickers, Riotstickers.com. This guy, Josh Grove, he has a phenomenal independent business. Um, and he has some great deals. We, we have a promo code that's going to be coming. It's my name, From Us. So if you use the From Us promo code, you will get a really, really good deal on stickers. And I don't know what the full thing is. We've got we to gotta take a look. But we're going to definitely be plugging this on the show. So don't get, you know, you know how I do the Patreon thing. Well, now I'm doing the, 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 the riot stickers.com thing. Yes. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the for the congratulations. Yes, John, voice of doom. Guys, you gotta see John live. He's like a he, I said this to him the night of. I hope I hope he does doesn't take this the wrong way. He is graceful like a ballerina, dude. He has such confidence as a front man. It was really fun to watch him just get so lost in in uh in the music that they were making. And they really do the best version of of wolf's blood ever and i recorded it with my phone and i'm uploading it to my channel with the title best cover of wolf's blood ever um so so yeah so this is coming riotstickers.com check them out i don't think you can use the promo code yet but when you need vinyl vinyl stickers that's you're going to go and when we end this video we're going to play well let me play this first so this is the video that I will be playing on the show. I'm going to introduce it to you right now. This is uh, written by the guy in Less Than Jake. You know the band Less Than Jake? Check this out. It's, it's uh, 60 seconds. Check this out. I, I really, really love that video. I think it's really great. And uh, Chris, I'm so glad to hear that you'll go there. Make sure you use the from, from his promo code. I hope I hope Josh sets it up. And freaking just check them out. Robbie Bloodshed, I don't mind name dropping him. I know he do, has done business with ridestickers.com. Uh, Joe Vasta, JV Bastard from uh, Darrow Chemical Company and Mr. Monster. He's done uh, business riotstickers.com. I myself have done business with riotstickers.com, and we have just had, uh, uh, we have all had incredibly positive experiences uh, working with Josh. He's just really, really good, and he prints. The stickers are great, really, truly. Um, what else do I want to say? Uh, what else is coming up on the show while well, I have you all here? Freaking... 
we okay so there's a couple of patreon exclusive videos that will be coming up um i can't say anything more about it than that but they will be so you patreon people you will be in for a treat if you belong to as youtube members youtube we have the youtube membership as well same thing except uh patreon is cheaper um you will also be uh treated to that as well um we are definitely going to oh also thursday we have uh, another episode with sinful celluloid uh more on that real soon uh what else i have tons of clips guys i've been clipping up the shows so you can see a lot of clips coming if you watch the long shows then you are definitely gonna it's gonna feel redundant but for those of you who don't like watching the long ass shows you can just watch the tiny little clipped parts you know what i mean um you know ballad my topic it's my topic for thursday and i have not picked it yet i have to do that I've just been very, very busy. And, you know, if you guys want to sponsor the show, you can, you know, come talk to me about it. If you if you have a way of hitting me up, hit me up and you want to sponsor the show, fucking do it, man. Do it. We got ridestickers.com. So excited. Really excited to be working with a, with an independent business of such integrity. Really like Josh. Um, trying to think of what else to say. Let's go to some of these comments here. Oh my God. It's 11 already. I got to wake up. Um, I don't know what is going on in this chat right now. Did I get the message you sent about red shark? Chris? Yes, I did. Uh, just on, on the to-do list. We have a lot of guests coming up. Some of them. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I like, I really like working with Chris though. Chris is great. Chris and I, we, we have wonderful podcast conversations and I really like it a lot. Um, you'd like to talk to me offline if possible. Uh, just send me an email with whatever you want to discuss and you know, uh, I'll get to it when I get to it. Um, what else can, let's see what else we got here. I would love a Lodi Pizza sponsorship. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. You can say you could say P E N I S in the chat. I'm not going to say it on air, although I did cuss a few times. Have I heard the Mits the Misfits Mass Mass Mus album? I guess like the Christmas Misfits Mass album. Hmm. No, I have not. Um, anything else? Yeah. We're going to, I have a feeling that VFW is awesome. It's an awesome place for a venue. I'd like to see more. I would like to see more. Thank you. Thank you about somebody just congratulated me. Oh, here. Thank you. I Steve is awesome, man. I got to tell you, I was really, I really liked doing this interview a lot. I, I learned a lot, a lot. There was a lot of stuff that I didn't know. So it was really, really cool to hear Steve sort of um, uh, say what's up. Yeah, Rue was also at the uh, VFW show as well. It was very nice to meet Mr. Rue. We met Dagger Love as well. Um, saw a bunch of people. It was really great. It was really, really great. Um, I think, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Chris says that his son won the raffle at the VFW. That's great. Yeah, we did a raffle um that was really great i'm glad you enjoyed it amy um ruth is cough cool stuff Ru, did you show the video to your son brandon um rue took a video of me singing some kind of hate live i did some kind of hate live at this show with tony from the secret subway and i watched the video back and it is so embarrassing <laughs> it's so bad Man, you don't realize it's when you watch the playback and you just go, oh, because <laughs> when you're in it, when you're in it, you know, I don't know. I don't freaking know. Um, yes, yeah, Steve did give a release date for the new Black 29. He says, te I think it's tentatively April. Uh, there's also a music video. It's I guess this is the official. Uh, it's officially out now that I am directing a new music video for black 29 for Cleopatra records. Um, 
in this music video is for a cover. And like you said, it's got the guy from 69 Eyes, Johnny Kelly, Tommy Victor, of course, Steve. And we're, that will come out at some point. These, you know, things take time, people. Things take time. Is there anything else, guys? Is there anything else we need to cover before we bounce out of here? I, I hate to, to leave you, but it is uh, it is late and I have to wake up tomorrow. There's things to do, videos to edit, things to discuss. Um, <laughs> do you say, I sang, I most certainly sang Iron Lung. You know, I did that acapella thing that I did on my on my channel go check out my acapella I did an acapella of some kind of hate and I you know it's a fun little garage band recording but when we were I was doing we didn't rehearse it or anything we I just jumped up there and we did some kind of hate and so I tried to replicate some of that and it's really cringy and embarrassing but I'm not I'm still going to post it I am still going to post it and credit to Dagger Love oh Dagger Love has it on video as well I was gonna say credit to to Rue Morgue Dagger Love has it on video as well. Yo, email it to me, man. Dagger Love, email it to me, please. You can you can post it if you want, but uh, email it to me as well. To the video business media at gmail.com. I did not know that. Johnny Kelly is playing drums now in Quiet Riot. I thought all the guys in Quiet Riot were gone. Huh. Let's see. Um, all right, we're going to end with the Patreon video. I keep saying, and I'm just checking something out right there. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Whew. I was so, I, I, you know, when at the beginning it was a little, we were having camera problems. I was like, oh my God, no, not for this one. Um, Freaking, yeah, thank you. Google Drive it. Yes, yes. I would love nothing more than to have I would love nothing more than to have uh, Henry Rollins on the show. I I can't say that I came close to interviewing Henry Rollins many years ago, but I sure shit tried, and it did not it did not work out. But I would love to, love to, love to talk to Henry Rollins. It would be really great. Thank you, thank you, Tommy. Appreciate it. Let's go all the way up in the chat just to see if we missed anything. Oh, no, this is, no, there's nothing there. Um, I, I don't know. I think, I think Henry would, I think Henry would eat me for lunch. He'd be like, he'd think I was just a pedantic, semantic prick, you know? Um, I don't know about Mandy, but I definitely could get Mr. Jim on here for, for sure. I could get Mr. Jim. Should I should I talk to Mr. Jim? He that would be a lot of fun to have Mr. Jim on. Um definitely could do that. He's he's around. He's around. Mr. Jim's awesome. Who are some other dream guests that I'd want to have on besides Glenn? I, man, you know, it would be Glenn I would I know how I would approach a Glenn interview. It would not be easy, dude. Glenn is Glenn I feel like you have to you can't talk to Glenn about music stuff. I feel like you'd have to talk to him about movies. You know? Um get I man, I want to talk to John Christ and I most certainly want to talk to Erie. I, I want to ask Erie about the transition from Sam Hain to Danzig and working with Rick Rubin. I'd love to hear that his point of view on that. That'd be very interesting. And yes, I'd love to talk to John Christ. That would be really cool as well. Um, I I don't think Jerry or Doyle. Maybe I don't know, man. Maybe, maybe you know there there might be an angle. There might be an angle to sort of do it. Yeah. There's Riot stickers right now. I don't know if you saw me play the video. It's a great video. Played really well, Josh. Here's our sponsor, guys. Riot stickers. Go check out riotstickers.com. Make sure to do that, everybody. Please. Check it out. I, he's going to set up a promo code from us. You know, okay, I did. I, I was hanging out with Bobby Steele the other day. Uh, Chris Allo. I hope I'm saying your name right. 
he invited me on to Rock Fantasy. Shout out to Rock Fantasy Channel. Go subscribe to them because they got a really cool channel. And we did a panel with Bobby Steele. And I learned some stuff from Bobby Steele. Great insights from Bobby Steele on some things. Um, so you can go check that out. Go search Rock Fantasy and then The Misfits. It's just The Misfits show. And that, it was me, Bobby Steele, Chris, Steve, and... Oh, this guy from this metal band, uh, Invocation. You guys know Invocation? All right, what's the question? Uh-oh. Anytime you mention... I met this guy, Noodles, by the way. He... You know, I, I I love it when people like come up and just like, hey man, what's up? I'm this guy on the on the internet because you know you talk to people on the internet, but you don't actually know people on the internet until you know you see them in real life. So it was very nice to meet Noodles. <laughs> and anytime you mention Bobby Steele to Noodles, his ears perk up. Um, Noodle, uh, uh, wait, where did I just miss that? Yeah, Chuck Biscuits is. I would love to talk to Chuck Biscuits. That would be that that that's like. That's like that's like finding Sasquatch. That's like finding Bigfoot. That's not going to happen. Um, you spoke to Bobby Steele face to face right before. What's your question, um, Godless six 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 six? Um, but yeah, check that out. You know, I I really do want to have eerie and john on i think they would both be very interesting yes oh my god bob aleka that is a dream guest he is still alive and i think i know a way to get in touch with him scum love would be great oh wow wow i know that guy scum love i don't know him but i know who he is i definitely should hit him up that would be cool you know Sherm, you've said this before. You said from us saved my life. What do you mean by that? How did I save your life, dude? I mean, I'm I'm really happy to know like that I that I did, if I if that's true. But like what did I do? How did I save your life? Just by talking on YouTube? I, I mean, explain. You have to explain that. Um Bobaleka has to be 103. No, he's probably in his 70s, 80s, maybe. Maybe. I I'm going to I could try I could try for Aleka. That's I think that's that's possible. No, Noodles is not from the Offspring Amy. I know who you're referring to. You mean Noodles from the Offspring. No, this guy Noodles, man, he just he one time he got into a traffic altercation with Bobby Steele and now he he's got Bobby Steele on the brain nonstop. He'll tell you all about it. He loves talking about it. Um I would love to talk to London May, Ballad. I would love to. That would be a great get. I would love to have London May on. I feel like he'd make for great conversation. He would be a very interesting person to talk to, for sure. There's 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 guests to be gotten. There is guests to be gotten, for sure. How about understanding... What does that say? How about understanding Sam Hain songs like you did on another show for your misfits. I don't know what you mean. Jerry in the show would be the best show ever. Maybe if he's in a good mood, he would accept it's worth a try, but I noticed he stopped with, you know, Raphael. I noticed that as well. He has stopped. I bet you that's a stipulation of some kind. He has stopped doing interviews. He hasn't done an interview in five years. He hasn't done an interview in five years. Hey, what's going on? For the kids. For the kids. That'd be great. <laughs> oh, man. I'm just having too much fun. I got to go. I really got to go. Yeah, see, Noodles really wants this to happen. He wants Bobby's license taken away. You know, Noodles, I was just, as I just said, I was just on a show with, with him. Uh, interesting. Steve thinks that Jerry was silenced. Nobody can silence Jerry only. He is... He is a force of nature. Do a deep dive on Glenn's book collection. Didn't he already do that, though? Glenn already did that. Um, Interview Davey Havoc about what? Interview Davey Havoc about what? About Son of Sam and his... I, I mean, Davey Havoc is probably a, probably a hard get. Probably not, not easy. Probably not easy. Guys, this is really fun. I'm going to go. Really, truly. I really appreciate all of you. Like I said, 
Thank you, everybody, for your support tonight. Dagger, Undead, um, whoever else, really appreciate it. Um, for the kids, always for the kids. And again, super shout out to Steve Zing, who just, like, it, this was such a, a, a treat. And he really, um, he really broke things down for us on the show. Thank you, Sherm. <laughs> Sherm is such a sweet guy. Love you from us. Thanks, man. <laughs> What, what is this? What is this comment? Real. Yeah, that's right. Real accounts of werewolf encounters. This is true. Interview Glenn's Cub Scout den leader. What is this? Oh, yeah. Holler at Graves. Oh, boy. No, thanks. I did try. I tried to get a Toro to come on my show. He was cursing me out on his show. It was brought to my attention that he ended every show with fuck Jeff from us. So I did like a little remix and then did a little imitation of Graves doing his Graves dance. And then, um, <laughs> and then invited, I was like, I wanted a tour to come on. He wouldn't do it. So, Hey, listen, they're out there doing their thing. Good for them. Oh my God. That would be, that would be nuts. Here's the thing, though. As long as Graves didn't, doesn't have the mute button because he'll just mute me and boot me like he did last time. So it wouldn't, I don't think that would work out. It, it wouldn't work out. Um. All right, guys. I'm going to end it with the Patreon. Guys, again, if this is your first time here, please make sure to like, share, and most of all, subscribe. Check out riotstickers.com. Promo code from us. That might not be operational yet, but when it is, there's a really good deal for it. And lastly, if you want to see me keep doing this, um, continue on GoPro, friggin' uh, check out the Patreon. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Patreon, here's a little thing about it. Peace and hair grease. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jeff. So I've decided to make a Patreon. What is Patreon? I don't know how to define a Patreon. Let me look it up. Patreon is a membership platform that makes it very easy for creators to get paid for the things that they're already creating. I want to do it full time. I want this to be my full time job. In my efforts to make that happen, I've set up this platform. Is it going to work? Is it going to be successful? I don't know, but I would rather try and crash and burn than not try at all. The goal is to create enough passive revenue so that I can continue to do this full time uninterrupted. Why? Because I love to do this. I love creating content. I love making videos. I love shooting films. I love doing podcasts. In case you couldn't tell, I love to talk and I never shut the fuck up. <laughs> so right now I've kept the Patreon incredibly simple. There's two tiers and that may change in the future. The Murdergram is a simple way to extend support for all of the hours and hours of free content on the channel for nothing more than a dollar. 38 cents goes to Patreon. What's a buck 38, eh? It's less than a cup of coffee, but it's a great way that you can show support for very little effort. When you divide that dollar 38 by the hours and hours and hours of time spent listening to this endless drivel of content, the dollar cost average works out. Next up is the YouTube casualty for $6 and 66 cents. <laughs> The YouTube casualty is loaded to the gills. Enjoy the archive ad-free as well as ad-free early access to special docu-style podcast videos, music reaction commentaries, and the like a month before they drop on YouTube, loaded with ads, I might add. You're also going to get exclusive content and behind-the-scenes content that is not available on YouTube or anywhere else. So you get to peek behind the veil. And believe me, there's a couple of choice pieces. Most of all, more than anything, whether you join the Patreon or not, I just want to thank each and every one of you that comes to the channel, that watches all the shows, that leaves comments, that participates, that subscribes. That's really the most important thing. This is just trying to find a way to earn a living as an artist. And with that, thank you for my TED Talk. Join the Patreon, because we need you! 66 cents.